Thank you. We've all seen those images on the telly and in the newspapers. You know the ones. The images of people in need, in need of food, in need of shelter, in need of medical care. Often these images are taken in the first few days, weeks, months of a displacement crisis. What we see far less of is where these people are 10, 20, 30 years down the line. In the context of displacement caused by conflict, the answer is they're pretty much in the very same countries that they first sought refuge in. We call this a protracted displacement crisis. And the reality is that for many of those people, the three so-called durable solutions for displacement advocated by UNHCR are often just out of reach. Going back home, that's not really an option when the people that made up home are no longer there. The houses that they once lived in, no longer standing. Third country resettlement, I hear you say. Well, we see how that's going. Countries in the global north keep on building walls to keep those people out. That leaves us with the third so-called durable solution, integration in the country of first refuge. But those countries are already under intense economic pressure. They can barely meet the needs of those who are already there, the citizens, let alone people who are arriving from somewhere else. So sadly, that's not really an option either. So what happens to those people 10, 20, 30 years later? Are their needs still the same? How are they coping with exile? What kind of opportunities are being made available to them and to their children? How are they getting by? These are some of the questions that guided our research on a project that we call Protracted Displacement Economies. To date, uh, we've undertaken baseline surveys in four countries covering 14,000 households. We've carried out a further 2,800 panel surveys to get a better sense of how things may change over time. We've gathered over 600 in-depth testimonies from displacement affected people and produced 12 short documentary films. Also, that we can better understand how the economic relations and structures play out in the lives of displacement affected people. So here we've adopted a broad understanding of economy that captures not only the provision of material goods and services through the aid sector, but also the understandings of care and mutual support that are so important in the lives of displacement affected people. People help each other out a lot in these kinds of situations. So here's an example of the, the kinds of care, understandings of care and mutual assistance that we found. This was, uh, this was from an interview with a gentleman from Afghanistan living in Chitral in Pakistan. And he was speaking to us about the host community. And he told us, these people are very poor themselves. How could they support us? We're thankful because they allowed us to collect wood from the mountains they call home. We've taken their timber and our animals have grazed on their land and they've never objected to that. We still do this. They've shown us great sympathy, but they couldn't offer us money. They had none themselves. They're still helpful in other ways. I mean, they'd go to police stations with us to provide a character reference and even bail I mean, who else would do that? They've been very kind. Oftentimes, policymakers and academics become fixated on livelihoods and the role that the market plays in, in the interactions between refugees and the local economies. And while these financial transactions may be very important, they don't reveal the whole story. A Palestinian friend living uh, from Yarmouk camp in Syria, now resident in Istanbul, summed up for me how the cogs of a displacement economy don't necessarily align very well. He told me that there's this surprising phenomenon, really, uh, you know, a really surprising phenomenon of Syrian families magically growing by two. 
What do you mean? I asked him. Well, he said, at the very least, they have to put out an extra couple of chairs at the, di uh, at the dinner table, one for the humanitarian and one for the journalist. In Turkey, they have an expression, her shaka da bir var, that in every joke, there is a truth. And the uncomfortable truth is they could have put a third chair out at that dinner table, one for the academic, at least in some contexts. The point of the story is that refugees and other displaced people are the center of a particular kind of economy. It's an economy that they are simultaneously excluded from having any kind of meaningful benefits from. They're seen as people with little in the way of skills and life histories. The presence of refugees creates multiple employment opportunities uh, for others, but they themselves, well, they're often denied the right to work in the country of first refuge. The binary of refugee and host doesn't quite capture the complexity of the kinds of interactions that we see in these settings. Neither category is homogenous. And in fact, displacement attracts with it a particular uh, shifting cast of characters. You find humanitarian workers, academics, researchers, policy wonks, military personnel, property developers, filmmakers, journalists, all of them with their own agendas and all of them bringing their own economic capacities. So let's now really stick our face in the mud and start talking about money. Do you want to hazard a guess as to how much we spend on humanitarian aid every year? I won't ask you. Hundreds of millions. Hundreds of millions. Should we play a bit of, play your cards right? Higher, lower? <laughs> higher. Higher, how much higher? Globally, annually? I think it's something like it's billion because we're looking at each country since we've started. $28 billion every year. Might sound like a significant sum of money. It is. It can do a lot of good work. But we need to put it into perspective a little. It's as much as what you and I spend on chewing gum every year. It's a third of what we spend on pet food globally but it's not pocket change. If we put it to productive use, it could be truly transformative. So how do we get that vital resource to the people that need it most, displaced people? Remember, there's an economy that emerges by dent of the fact of displacement itself. There was no economy before that. It's a particular economy, one that's worth $28 billion. So what do displaced people get? Well, in the winter, the harsh climate coincides with a season of goodwill and the, uh, the aid sector reminds us of our obligations to those less fortunate. There's a need to buy some essential items to help people overcome and cope with the cold, bleak winters. And amongst those items is the ubiquitous polyester thermal blanket. Aid actors and agencies ask us for donations and they seek out funding from state mandated donor agencies to be able to purchase these core non-food related items such as the blanket to distribute amongst displaced people but they themselves don't make the blanket, right? No, no. They procure these items from the private sector. So what usually happens is that they purchase the blanket, in this case, from a company, and surprise, surprise, based in the global north. That company has a long-standing and trusted relationship with the aid sector. This company then subcontracts the manufacture of said blanket to another company in the global south, in South Asia, in East Asia. Well, by the way, the, the labor laws are not so stringent, huh? So that really makes us 
think about where that $28 billion goes. Does it go to displaced people? So how much did UNHCR spend? And remember, this is just one UN agency. How much did it spend on goods and services in uh, displacement affected countries in 2022? Any idea? 100 million. 100 million, says the learned gentleman to my left. $905 million, 10% of which was on blankets, bedding, mattresses, and towels. That's 90 million. In short, there's a hell of a lot of money and a hell of a lot of business being made by some people somewhere along the lines. So why can't blankets be made, uh, or blankets be made by, as well as for, displaced populations. Why can't they have the cake and eat it? Well, they can. And this is how. The idea of an anchor institution, or an institution that provides an anchor to the economic lives of the residents in which that institution is located, was first pioneered in Cleveland, a city in the United States of America that had long experienced post-industrial decline and blight and was synonymous with the phrase Rust Belt America. The institutions of the city of Cleveland, the hospitals, the universities, the local municipalities that had an epiphany. They realized that for far too long, they'd been operating under a false economy, procuring goods and services from outside of the city, and in some cases, from even outside of the state, under the logic of lowest priced tenders. They realized that they had a learning role to play, training community-owned enterprises to meet their procurement needs. And in doing so, they were able to keep those resources, those much needed resources in their locality for those people who had hitherto been disenfranchised, marginalized, excluded, the often poor, the often African-American neighbors that lived next door to them. And, in, and this allowed them to generate more spending, more jobs, creating a multiplier effect. So could something like this work in a protracted displacement setting? What kind of institutions are there in these protracted displacement settings that can be there for the long haul? Which institutions have the capacity to play that learning role? Which institutions have the capacity to open up their procurement to allow it to be met by local enterprises? I think you might see where I'm going with this. The aid sector ticks a lot of those boxes. However, despite many of those working in the aid sector, um, recognizing that things have to change, that the system is broken, that things cannot go on as they are, the status quo persists. So how do we get an aid sector to reimagine what its role is? How do we get those working in the aid sector to give up some of those perverse and dysfunctional behaviors while everyone else in the aid sector keeps on doing the same? How do we make what happened in Cleveland an incontrovertible possibility in displacement settings such that even a government, and I'm not naming names, that is hostile to migrants might knock on my door one day and say, Tahir, how do we do this? Any enterprise needs scaffolding. It needs evidence enable to convince other peoples to buy into the idea. It needs researchers on the ground working closely with those who respond to protracted displacement 
So what I'm proposing is a displacement economies lab. Don't get frightened by this very busy chart. And there are two parallel streams to this. The first is a developmental stream. Here, there is a potential for those aid institutions to play that anchoring role, to open up their procurement capacity for the early development of enterprises owned and led by displacement-affected communities. Anchoring the early stage of the market for that enterprise would be such an important safety net, particularly in the, the first few months, perhaps even year of an enterprise. And it would also possibly provide avenues for market diversification later. Anchoring aid in this way could possibly open up ways for paying it forward. Anchoring aid in this way creates the space to establish a community investment fund. Enterprises selected on the program would commit to investing in their communities, to contributing to the development and well-being of those communities. The whole process would be facilitated by a local implementing partner, whose role it would be to incubate those enterprises and provide mentoring, and to bring together refugees and hosts in joined shared common purpose. So the second stream is, is a learning stream. So we had a development stream, now we have a learning stream. Here, the lab, Displacement Economies Lab, acts as a vehicle for researchers engaged in the monitoring, evaluation and learning of the impacts and outputs of the program. Using a multi-level precarity index that we've developed through our current research. This makes it possible to aggregate the different indicators of precarity at different levels, at individual level, at the household level, at the community level. So, so this accompanied learning builds that evidence base that we need. And it also allows us to generate the case for shifting the procurement practices of the aid sector, more generally, in protracted displacement settings. So what we need, really, is an investment approach to displacement-affected communities in protracted situations. Care and maintenance, the way things have been done, isn't enough. In fact, 80% of our respondents told us that aid in its current form is not the most important source of income for them. It's not, but it is needed. So it's not just about giving aid. It's about providing opportunities, allowing people to hope, that yearning to hope and dream amongst young adults in displacement-affected communities is no different to the students that we find here at Sussex. So let me finish by telling you about Bassam. We ran uh, 10 day-long work film workshops in each of the countries that we worked in. And some of you might have seen uh, these films screened during Refugee Week last month uh, in Brighton. I was part of a team that worked with Syrian and Palestinian refugees in Lebanon. And at that workshop, I met Bassam. He was a young man, aged around 20, one of the filmmakers. And um, he'd arrived in, <coughs> in Lebanon from Syria at the age of 12. His entire secondary education had been disrupted. In fact, the piecemeal education that he had received was from a disparate collection of NGOs. And it was enough for him to have learned a trade. He was a sparky, an electrician. And they told him that he should, he should count himself lucky, that he'd learned a trade. So in March 2022, um, we ran the workshop. Tough time of year. A number of the workshop attendees, including Bassam, came down from the Bekaa Valley 
to Beirut to take part in, in the workshops. Now that's ordinarily a commute of around an hour and a half. One day, it took him six hours to get back to the Bekaa Valley because of the snow and ice on the roads. It took him another four hours the following morning to make it back to the workshop on time. Imagine that, imagine what that workshop must have meant to him, to have spent 10 hours on a public bus to make a work. I would have called in sick, but he didn't. So when they told us this, we said, this can't do. You know, we, you should be staying in a hotel. So we took him and some of the others to a nearby hotel in downtown Beirut. The concierge at the desk asked him his name and his profession. And without missing a beat, he said, my name's Bassam and I'm a filmmaker. That right there is the power of investing in displacement affected communities. It's truly transformational. Thank you.